22 years old when I came to prison. I was 30 years old when I went to prison. I was at the age of 19. I had just turned 19. Hi, I'm Chris, and I help life-sentenced men transition from institutionalized prison life back into society. Every one of our men has already served 25 to 45 years in prison. I serve on the board of the Corrections Transition Program at Everglades Correctional Institution in Miami, Florida. I teach these men life skills and how to speak, listen, and think. So when they get paroled, they become assets to their communities rather than liabilities of the state. Welcome to Men Going Home. I'm Chris Wolf, and we've got another great show for you today because we are the only show that brings you access to a segment of society very few people know anything about. Men who have spent more than 30, 35, and even 40 years in prison. We'll talk to them about their crimes, their life in prison, and what their transition back into the free world was like after all those years. Now, before we welcome our special guest today, please welcome my good friend and co-host of this show, Andy Korch. Andy, welcome. Thanks, Chris. Good to be here. Good to hear Barry Stevens' story today. Another guest with another amazing story, uh, just like last week's. Well, let's talk about last week's sure. guest, Barry Stevens. Mm -hmm. What was your take on his speech, on his uh, on his presentation last week? Well, uh, Barry was was an interesting character in that he seemed to live almost a double life. Correct. And you know he he was dealt a pretty you know bad hand. Born, his mother couldn't take care of him, so he had to you know be given to his aunt to at, take care of him at two months of age right at two months of age mm -hmm. and then back to his mother at 9 um and his mother as hard working as she was working two jobs she just couldn't really watch over him and you know and, he, he was the second guest we've had who had no guidance no father figure in his early life and they turned to the streets and then led a double life of crime a double life of crime that that he got an excitement about it wasn't just about the money in the armed robberies it was the excitement, the thrill of the crime that kept him going in a life of crime. I mean, committing, I think he said over 50 armed robberies. 50 over to 60 a, armed robberies. Yeah. And he never got caught. So I guess he thought that uh, he was invincible. But then again, what frequently happens, there's an accident with a gun. The gun goes off and somebody gets killed. Yeah. And, and it seems like that's a recurring theme as well. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these crimes, a lot of these murders are occurring because they just have a gun on them. They really weren't g intending to use it. But that's what happens when you're in a, you know, you're in a crime. And then anything. A, a, can and happen. then again, we get another example of a juvenile getting convicted of a horrific crime, being sentenced as an adult. And then we come back to that issue of maturity versus being sentenced as a, as an adult. Yeah, I mean, he really seemed Barry really seemed like a guy that had changed a lot. Was not the same person obviously that he was when he started in prison at the age of 17. Correct. Correct. Today's story is also compelling, so let's introduce today's guest. Today's guest was sentenced to life in prison in 1991 after being convicted of first-degree murder at the age of 32. His story is compelling because crack cocaine took over his life and he transformed from a hardworking family man with a wife and three daughters into a delusional homicidal crack addict who shot his crack dealer at close range over $90. Please welcome today's guest, Mr. William Steele. William, welcome to the show. Thank you. William, it's nice to have you here. I've known you for a number of years at Everglades Correctional Institution. You were paroled one year ago? April 14th, I was paroled uh, to my family. Um, I went to Noah's house in Tampa, mm -hmm. and then the COVID broke out there in the in the program I was in. So in less than three months, they allowed me to go to Jacksonville and live with my daughters. Well, let's talk about your early life and get a chronological view of your life and how you transformed from just a hardworking guy into, into a drug addict. You were born and raised in Orlando, is that correct? Yes, I was born and raised in Orlando. I have an older brother that's four years older, and I have a little sister that was born on the same day as I. Uh, she's four years younger, which happens to be also our grandmother's birthday, December right. 20th. Um, uh, my father ran a dairy farm. He was a foreman of a dairy farm. Well, but exactly. At age four, if my memory serves me correctly, you would actually work with your father 
on the dairy farm. What did you do at the age of four? I carried a bucket around, and I used iodine solution to wash the udders on the cows. So at four years old, I learned real quick that a cow side kicks right. and horses and horses bag kick. Right. So we got into 4-H. I was so small in the 4-H that I would hold the flags on the side of the ring. I'd have to tuck it into my boot, or the wind would blow me over with the flag. So it was just <laughs> a little shorty. Well, you, you talk about 4-H. I guess that was always, uh, you know, kind of the farm life people that we knew in high school. So you were very involved in 4-H from age 4 until, I believe, 17, and you then were around horses and rodeo? Yes, I was in a 4-H club, and my mom's best friend was a sponsor of 4-H, and she would take me during the summer to horse shows three times a week. We did the rodeos. Um, um, what did you do with the rodeo? Fair. Were you participated in the rodeos? Yeah, I rode bulls and bronx and, and did a Western Pleasure competition and different things. Um, we rode in the state fair. We did exhibition riding in the state fairs and things like that. I'm, su- that I'm surprised they let children ride bulls in a rodeo. That's got to be very dangerous. Did um, you get hurt? No, I never got hurt. <laughs> no? My girlfriend's the one that took me bull riding, so she was the first one. She rode ahead of me, so wow. she's a better rider than I was. <laughs> and then you also did other things other than, ro- I mean, you know, I mean, I played Little League baseball. I believe you did, too. Yeah. I never did any, you know, bull riding as a child, but you also played Little League All baseball? All the way up to Pony League, yeah. Were you a good player? I was a good player, but I wasn't exceptional. So I just enjoyed playing. Public school versus private school? Public school until I was about 14, and then my my brother got in trouble, and they sent me to private school. Oh, you went to private school? Yeah, for a little while. Then I ran away with my girlfriend and went to Arkansas. Uh, How old were you when you did that? 14. 13, 14. I was just turning 14. Why did you do that? I thought that my parents didn't love me, so they sent me to private school. And then what what happened was my brother— had just gotten in trouble. He'd gotten four armed robberies and sentenced right. to life. And um, and they wanted to get me away to that neighborhood. So they sent me to private school to get me out of that environment to try to keep me from doing the same path as my brother. Was it that environment that got him into that? It was his choices, but the the culture at that time was a lot of drugs in right. the early 60s, you know. Um, there was a lot of drugs in the late 60s and the early 70s, and it was kind of like the hippie days were phasing out. So there was a lot of drug involvement around. But but hold on a second. Cause I, I want to get into your brother because that's a fascinating story as well. But here's here's a question I have. You were in you were in high school, but you said in junior high you ran away with your girlfriend. Yeah. And then you went back to public school. Yes. Yes, I went back to public school. How did they get you back with your girlfriend? Your parents? How did you, well, you we get went back to Ar- home? We got picked up hitchhiking in Arkansas. And uh, we spent a couple nights in uh, jail, and it was kind of funny because I told the sheriff there I didn't want to go home. And he kind of went, I need a boy to work on my farm. Right. So when I called my mom, I told her I don't want to go home. So he got my mom on the phone. He goes, I need a good, strong boy to work on my farm. And he's spitting tobacco and everything. I goes, let me talk to my mom. So they finally came and got me and brought me home. So what happened? She was your girlfriend in public school. They sent you to private school, so you weren't with her anymore? No, there was a private school girlfriend. Oh. We lived there. We lived at the private school. Uh, Howie and Hills Academy, and uh, we lived there. And, uh, it was a boarding school. It was a boarding school. So, she and I both ran away together. But why did you run away? Because I thought that my parents, we had this dream that we would go down the, the mountains and do the Rocky Mountain um, Rocky trail. Mountain trail, High stuff, trail. Yeah, kind of like that. You know, we were young and impressionable. And um, there were so many different cultures from all over the country in that private school. That gotcha. They were bringing all kinds of different drugs and things in there. We were just kids experimenting. That's when you got started, first started getting into drugs? Actually, when I was about 12, I smoked pot for the first time. When I was probably right. eight, I was picking up my dad's beers and drinking them. And, you know, we'd run behind the house with a cigarette and smoke it until we hit the filter and things like that. Just as kids, we were experimenting with stuff. But wait a second now. So so you, you your parents get you back. You're in, in public school. Right. But then you have a motorcycle accident. You break your leg. Yeah, broke and you up. refused to go back to public school, correct? My parents demanded that I go to school. They're going to hire a tutor for me. But then I, you, but you refused to be tutored, right? And instead, I went to uh, a vocational school. Why did you refuse to go back to public school or be tutored? If my dad would have said go right, I would have went left. If okay. he would have said black, I would have said white. So, um, rebellious. So you yes, go to ro- vocational school and you become a welder? Yeah, I learned how to weld. At okay. West Orange Vocational High School. All right. Now, your sister was four years younger. Yes. Born on the same day of you, as you, but different years. Yes. And the same as my grandmother was December 20th also. All three of us were born on the same day. All right. Now, your brother. Your brother's four years older. 
four life sentences for four armed robberies. This is prior to October 72, and they didn't have these onerous sentences back then. So he got, we hired a lawyer, and he got time served and was released on life parole. And within four weeks, he violated it and went back for three and a half years in prison. Yeah, but here's a question. If you're, people listening are going, wait a minute. He was sentenced to life in prison. Right. Time served. What time? Well, we mitigated the sentence. And we mitigated could, the sentence. What does you, that mean? That means that the judge has opportunity to not make him go to jail, but instead to give him life parole. So this is prior to October of 1972 when the life became natural. Right, right. Okay, and they had a mandatory quarter tied to a lot of the capital felonies. So he fell in that window before 72 when life, you could do seven or eight years and get out. After October 72, they made it a mandatory quarter. So he fell in that window and he went to, he went to jail for three and a half years after he violated. Did he, was he a juvenile? No, he was he was eighteen. He was eighteen when he committed the the robberies, correct? So he never really goes to prison on the four life sentences, but then he he violates parole, right? He violates parole with drug use. He yeah, he was breaking into a bar on a beach and stole some alcohol out of it, and he went back for three and a half years, and then he got out and he moved in with me, and I'm working at the Cape at the time, and he ends up getting into drugs again and goes back for another three and a half years. And then he moves in with me, and he ends up going back for another two and a half years. And the third wow. time he got out, I says uh, he started getting moving in with me, and then he started getting into the drugs and stuff. I said, "No, you go live with mom." And he went right. live with my mom, and he's been out since 1982, all the way to when he passed away in 2017. Then, then he got married. He met a woman, kind of straightened out his life, but he had yeah. so many medical issues from drug use. He passed away at a at a relatively young age. Correct. He got hooked on uh, pharmaceuticals and kept drinking. And his liver shut down in 2017. Gotcha. So, so talk about your your mother, loving, nurturing. Always <clears> went to school. <throat> Ever since I can remember, she went to school, went to college, Rollins College, and she got um good in school. 72, she got a degree in computer science, science or yeah. whatever it was, and then after that, she went into business administration. She became a, a investment consultant for Dean Witter, and then she became an international realtor. Right. And uh, she worked for the telephone company for 18 years, and then when they took did it takeover um she was she got an early retirement okay and she kept going to school she's always gone to school and now i asked you about your father the first words were alcoholic drank a lot talk about your dad my dad was a really hard worker and then when i was about just before my brother got in trouble i think he he believed that my mom cheated on him and he started drinking and between my 14 year old and 16 year old my parents those are the divorce years but I believe she cheated on, or he thought she cheated on him for a number of years, correct? I'm not sure. You know, I was so young and impressionable. Okay. Your mother can't do any wrong. Okay. You know, I just remember the divorce years when he started turning really hardcore alcoholic. And uh, he wasn't very educated. He had like a fourth grade education. He could read and write minimally, but he would always tell people he didn't bring his classes and they would read for right. him and stuff. But right. he's highly right. intelligent. I remember riding the bicycle going to Eckerd's with tubes. He would fix fridge, uh, air condition, I mean, right. TVs and radios when the old tubes were. I'd ride the air conditioner to Eckerd Drugs with a bicycle and check all the tubes and buy the tubes I needed to fix radios and stuff. So when they shut down the dairy, he went to work in the air conditioning field and right. ended up doing mechanical contracting. But, you know, what's interesting, when you talk about your father and your family, there's a correlation. Your brother, forearm robberies, drug use. Your father was a heavy drinker, became a heavier drinker after he felt your mother was was cheating on him and having an affair. And you talked about an incident where he and his brother got incredibly drunk and he got into an argument with his brother and he shot his brother in the stomach. Your brother did not die. And then and then he went uh, he pleaded insanity. Correct. Talk about that. I, I I was working for Disney at the time and my father was living in Alabama in a dry county and they don't drink for socially they drink to get drunk and him and my uncle his younger brother were fighting and my uncle picked up a chair and was going to hit him with it we had a 410 in the corner with a flashlight taped to it what's a 410 uh, it's a shotgun okay uh full of bird shot for when mountain lions or bear got into the pig pen we would scare them off with a shotgun so my dad picks up the shotgun and tells my uncle that he'll shoot him if he tries to hit him and my uncle tried to hit him, and he shot him in the stomach. So he pleaded insanity. So me and my ex-wife, we weren't married then, 
we went to Alabama, and I got a leave of absence for Disney, and we went up there, and we stayed up there for, I think, four months while he was in the insane asylum right. um, beating the charge of attempted murder. So he shot your uncle and got six months, and then life went on? Yeah. Okay. All right, that's interesting, no? Did he get? Did he have a history of violence before or after that? Never, Not really. Never a violent person. But just a lot of alcohol. Just a lot of alcohol. I, from the time I was fourteen up. Right. Prior to that, they would drink beers and sit around, and you know we would do socially. We had family reunion, a lot of family reunions, right. and go right. to parks, and we always went on right. vacations every year. So now you go back. All right, he's out of the insane asylum. Right. You go back to Orlando. Now you were doing. You were working as a welder at Cape Canaveral. You were yeah. working for an employer who had a contract at Cape Canaveral. Mm-hmm. At Cape Canaveral. They lost the contract, so you know. get a job as a welder with Disney. Right. I worked for Disney for Talk 12 years. Talk about that. I Pretty good companies to work for. Excellent benefits and everything. I worked for Disney for 12 years, third shift, and um, during the day I started doing demolition and remodeling. For, but wait, uh, you were on the third shift first before yeah. you did that, because it was later you opened up the remodeling company. Third shift meant what? I worked from 11 to 8 in the morning. Okay. So. And what did you do there? I built maintenance rides. I've been all up under Disney. They have a mile and a quarter road that goes around the wardrobe down there, and I worked on every pavilion out of Epcot. Talk Uh, about the tunnel system at Disney. What is that like? It's a service road, actually, that gets you into all of the rides above it. So I could pull the truck down there, the welding truck down there, and pull all my leads up into the park and weld or, or run the electrical lines up there. And it was a way to maintenance the facility without actually going on top of the um, in the area where the, all the rides are. Like it's a small world, an energy pavilion. Yeah, people would land. never know that. Yeah, there's no. a whole tunnel system there. Disney has the world's second largest wardrobe. The world's largest wardrobe is the world is the United States government counting all branches of the military, and the forestry and everything. So well, Disney has a huge wardrobe. But so, you were working for you know really great companies. Yeah. Making good money? Yeah, yeah, I was union. I was union. Right. The shop's 60-40 union, so I worked on the union Well, and there. then you created another business. That you're working, you know, 11 p.m. to 8 a.m. at Disney, mm-hmm. and then you started a business called Renewed Renovations. Mm-hmm. You were doing renovation work, correct? Yes. yes, I worked for a leasing agent and a contractor, Bob Thornley, and um, during the day I had like two guys helping me with two crews and we would work and we'd do renovations uh, somebody would move out of a strip mall we'd go in and we'd renovate it and get it ready for the next tenant and um if they had to customize offices in there with bathrooms or showers or sleeping quarters whatever whatever right. they wanted we would make it for them we'd make studios or whatever whatever was required yeah. but now, at work. this point you're 22 years old yeah and what's interesting is you called yourself you said you were a functioning addict by the time you were 18 years old and you told me and I, I said, my God, you were using marijuana at 12 years old, alcohol and cigarettes at eight years old, THC pills, which is the in active in ingredient in marijuana at age 13, LSD at 13, mushrooms at 13, and cocaine at 17. Talk about how were you a functioning addict? Well, when I was working for Belco Steel for the Cape, I made a lot of money. And they didn't hire me because I knew what I was doing. They hired me because I just got out of vocational school and I was trainable. So I was a young kid, all the old guys sent to do the grinding, the sandblasting, the air arcing, the welding, and, you know, do all the technical work that was like a lot of labor. So I made a lot of money, and I had a lot of friends because money brings friends. So then I started getting in the environment. We'd have keg parties, and we would have uh, acid parties, and we would do cocaine parties, and free base was around. Um, we all quit free base when, when Richard Pryor caught on fire. Yeah, talk about that for a second, because you were, as you said, you were making a lot of money, you were doing a lot of cocaine, and you were free basing. Yeah. Explain. I never really understood free basing cocaine. What w- what is that? It's where you take the cocaine down and you break it down and back into its chemical form. Uh, use an ether and then you smoke it and when we were like five couples we all hung out together we we all got boats if i if my buddy got a boat we got a boat if i got a pool table they got a pool table it's kind of like keeping up with the joneses Mm -hmm. and um when richard pyre caught on fire we all made a commitment to stop because we saw all the hazard in that and everything. How so your wife, so excuse me, ahead, ahead. so your wife was, was participating in the drug use with you? Yeah, we're compatible Bible. like that. Okay. We're very compatible like that. How does somebody catch on fire 
freebasing cocaine? How did Richard Pryor, you know, you know, uh, combust himself? Ether has a lot of fumes. Yeah, I, I can be in the next room and light a match, and it'll it'll right. light just like gas. It'll light the whole house on fire. And that's how he got on fire. Uh, I think he was even in a room locked by himself. Yeah. And that's one of the things you get seclusionary when you get addicted to um, to freebasing and even crack cocaine. So. All right. Now we fast forward here. At age 26, which is June 10th of 1984. I think we even have a few pictures uh, that we can bring up. You got married to Rose. Um, uh, you had been together for five years, but actually the first thing that happened was you, it looks like you bought a house in October of 83. Yeah. Uh, you had a daughter born in 80, December, December of 83, December. and then you got married in June of 84, and then you had two more daughters. Yeah, we wanted to give the baby a good family environment, so we saved up, and, and uh, my my ex-wife worked for Mama B's Sub Shop, a sandwich shop, for 33 years, mm-hmm. so when I met her, she was working there, and uh, very hard worker so we wanted to give the baby a good name and a good home so we got married actually we had a double wedding me and my sister both had got married in the springs in altamont which my uncle owned and um my mom was very happy she got 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 rid of two kids at once and got two you know stepson a son-in-law and a daughter-in-law at the same time and then we we had the baby um in in december and we got married in june then we had two more babies that were two two years apart and our last last baby was born on uh, leap day in 1988. So okay. I have three little daughters. So it's a, it's a normal family, right? I mean, yeah. aside from the the drug, drug use, use, which yeah. we were probably hiding, sure. both you and your wife, it was just a normal family, oh, yeah. hardworking ballet. We sent the kids to ballet. You know, all the kids. Some of them wanted to do jazz or size, whatever they wanted. They were pretty much spoiled. Okay, and I'm, I had bought two more houses, and um. My mom and dad lived close to me. Actually, my dad moved in the house right behind ours. And I split it in half and made one half an efficiency for my dad. And we rented out the other half, and my dad lived there for free. So you're doing well. I mean, yeah. you're buying houses. Well, yeah, yeah you're, you're making money at yeah. Disney. You've got this renewed renovations company. I collected antique cars. R- I had Rose is wagons. making money at the sub shop. Right. You, you, you bought three houses and a vacant lot. You, yeah. you had an auto collection. Yeah. And you have a hunting camp in Georgia. Everything is going pretty well. Yeah. However, however, 1988, you know, so everything for four, five, six years is going well. But in 1988, you're using drugs at a heavier level, especially cocaine. You're injecting cocaine and snorting cocaine. Talk yeah. about that. Yeah, I went, you know, when I first started working at Disney, I was just because cocaine will open your pupils up and you can't weld with it. So you have to be very discriminate on what you do when you're welding. Um, Disney has five quality control inspectors goes behind every weld that I do. The Cape didn't have that. I mean, they had inspectors. But <laughs> Disney is really scrutinous about welds. So I had That's to meet funny. the specifications for Disney. And I would use coffee to get me home, you know, get me through the night and home in the morning type of thing. And some mornings I would just pull over to the side of the road and sleep for half an hour and wake up. Um, but eventually I escalated. And started doing cocaine and started doing methamphetamine, you know, like you're doing speed, morphine, doing, doing quaaludes. Speed. Eventually, I got you know, whatever was available in the drug scene, we would do. I was like a weekend warrior, but going to work, I would do speeds, little black beauties and stuff. And then eventually, I started getting into cocaine and I started dealing and stuff enough so that I would have enough supply. So I became a dealer to keep myself fluid in, uh, in the drugs. And then in 18, 1988, a friend of mine, um, I told him, I said, don't ever, I don't ever want to shoot up drugs again. And he handed me a pipe and says, we'll try this. And I tried crack cocaine. That's when, <clears> that's <throat> when your life changed. You did crack. Dramatically changed. I was controlling everything else in my addiction. Right. Everything was under control pretty much. Yeah. Until you started using crack. Right. Why was crack different? Talk about that high. It's not the high. It's it uh, takes over your mental faculties as far as your control receptors in your brain. Um, it convinced my me that I didn't need to eat food, that I just needed crack cocaine, uh, that I didn't need to go home to my family, that I just needed to find more drugs. So it became where I would get paid and I would come home for three or four days. Wow. Uh, you know, and then I would go right back to work. <coughs> so it, it was really bad. My 
I would leave my wife and three kids and go find drugs. I went right. to rehab the first time was a Disney sponsored little thing like right. marriage counseling. Then I went to Center for Behavior, uh, Behavioral Center in Orlando. I was their first crack addict. They didn't know how to treat me. Then I went to Phoenix South. Right, but here's here's a question. You told me when I met you at the Lifer program mm -hmm. at, at, at Everglades Correctional that you said nobody wanted you around and you you were a really bad guy. Is yeah. this that period of time? Yes, it's because I lied so much for my addiction that when I would pull up in somebody's house, they would turn off the lights, not answer the door or the phone, and pray that I would leave because I was nobody wanted to be around me. I was you, just a lying. When you say I, nobody, it'd be your your my family, family yeah, my family too, my my friends, everybody, everybody. I mean, I was just because they they couldn't they couldn't handle what happened to me. You know, the kid they saw the transition from me going from a normal father, loving father, to a monster. Right. So you said co you said crack cocaine took away all your free will. Talk about that. It did. I didn't have any control. I mean, even in the rehab, I would go to rehab. I would get uh, clean for a few weeks, and then I would be the designated driver for all my friends going to the bars. And within a few weeks, I'd be drinking again. And that was a gateway for any any substance for me is a gateway to something worse so and, i i yeah. don't do anything <laughs> obviously marital problems now yep counseling yeah talk about that um effect on your marriage was my bad ex-wife uh, just before everything happened she moved in with my mom and that was just like a, a fire for me to get crazy you know to go crazy um she filed for divorce um she did all, everything she could do within her power to try to get me to straighten up she did I, I went out one night, and she had my three daughters lined up in a row like this, praying on their knees, singing, Daddy, don't do it. Please don't do it, Daddy. Don't do drugs. My gosh. How old were they? Little? Four and six. Wow. Well, they were 18 months, you know. Yeah. Wow. They were young. Three and, you, and you, five. what you told me was that you literally abandoned them to go out and do more it, drugs. It's just insane. I was just insane. It overtook your life. Yes. I ended up being so... Uh, suicidal you know i just got every time i go around my family i hurt them you know I, I got i couldn't control it so i just wanted to kill myself you know just crazy i'm too much of a coward to do that i think what if i hurt myself and i just end up paralyzed i couldn't do nothing i'd just be sitting there like that so i was in a quandary i didn't know exactly how to do it so i tried overdoses through injections and stuff like that and, and I, I just couldn't do it so so and i don't mean to go ahead chris here go ahead it seems like you were on a path to to die to destruction yes and and so maybe prison kind of saved you in a it sense did. it rescued me it rescued my family also so february 1990 you go to buy crack from a guy named albert salter but then on your way into the crack house somebody says hey you have any you have any weed yeah. what happens i uh they asked me if i had any joints and i and i hand them two joints and i'm I get about 10 feet, and they had me on the ground with guns in my, in my head, and they arrested me for sale and delivery of marijuana. And I just stopped by the gas station, and I put 10 in the tank, and I put 10 in my pocket. And the 10 in my pocket, they pulled out and said it was buy money. And so, Even though you just gave the guy two joints for yeah, free. Yeah, it was kind of crazy. And I can tell you that after I went to prison and I was convicted of murder, I'm in prison doing life, and they pull me back to the county jail and try me for two joints of marijuana. Right, right. They don't try me once. I beat the first trial because I could prove and demonstrate that there was no buy money, that that $10 bill, the serial number on it, was not on their buy list. And then they had right. another trial two weeks later, and the cops got together and lied and convicted me of sale and delivery of two joints. But you get you get arrested at this crack house basically giving away two joints. Right. What was, describe what a crack house looks like. Well, this one didn't, it, it's missing windows. It doesn't have electric. It doesn't have any plumbing. The people in the house are um, are using candles to see by. Um, they're going next door and getting a five-gallon bucket full of water to flush the toilet. Right. Things like that. Right. Um, so it was their parents' house, and their parents passed away and left it to the kids, and the kids were all crack addicts. I know the family. And this, uh, in a family man like you are, this going to a place like this was a common occurrence at that point? Once I got hooked on drugs, I started going where I would never go prior. I started doing things I would never do prior in my right mind. Um, the drugs took over all my free will and led me in places that I'd never want to go, um, that I would never do in my right mind. And it led me to spend money and do things that I would never do, you know, if I was in my right mind. 
So you were arrested for selling two joints even though you gave them away. Right. Uh, and you go to jail. And but a, fr- a, friend, a friend of mine that yeah. was second in command at the jail I went to school with, he came downstairs and peeked his head in a little trap and says, listen, what you doing here? I'll have you out in a minute. And I got out on my own reconnaissance, R&R, and I was out that day. And then I went go back to get my car, and they'd stole the battery out of it. The guy's brother had stole the battery out of it. Right. And so I called the police. We had a police report and everything. And, I, and then I got my car. I got a new battery and drove it home. So fast forward five months later, uh, May of 1990, you're 31 years old. You go back to the crack house. This time you're looking to buy some crack. Right. And you you give this Albert Salter $90 for a cookie of crack. Yeah. What? The cookies go from anywhere from a 90 to 180 but he took my money. $90. Yeah. He took my money and split. And he took off. He ripped you off $90. Yeah. What happened? Well, I came back with a shotgun, and then I called him into the window, and I shot him. And uh, the next, and that was it. I, I, I took off. I thought I'd gotten away with it. Um, there was but no wait a minute. Take, it, take us through this. So what happens is you're mad. At this point, you want, you're more concerned that you didn't get the crack that you were there to buy. You're delusional. You're homicidal. This guy just stole $90. You go home. You get a shotgun. Mm-hmm. You come back. You get out of the car with a shotgun. You walk up to the house. What happens? I actually pulled it to the next lot. Okay. Okay, and I walked through the side lot. Okay, and I called him to the window and shot him. He came to the window. Did he open the window? There's no window there. There was no window. So he's standing in front of the window. Right. And then you pulled the gun up. Did he, you know, were you hiding the gun or you just no. lifted it and shot? No, it's nighttime. It's in the middle of the night. So he never saw it. He never saw it coming? Never saw it coming. And you were sure at that moment you had killed him? Absolutely. And and you were just out of your mind. I mean, you didn't obviously think that there was something to be accomplished by shooting him over ninety dollars, right? I wasn't even thinking in my right mind. I, no. I can't, you know, I can make a, I can try to justify it, rationalize it, and everything, but nothing made sense then. Okay, I'm not just in my addiction. I'm going through withdrawals in my addiction too, and everything was crazy. I mean, I was crazy. Were there um, witnesses? Not. No, there were no witnesses. There was one guy that said he saw something, but he didn't actually see anything. Um, so you just, you know, you shoot him and you get back in your car and you drive home. Right. And and the next day we're watching the news, me and my contractor friend that I do work for, and I'm, and I'm on the news, armed and dangerous. Do not, do not approach. And my friend. Um, this is your contractor friend, Bob. Right. Bob, he uh, has a friend that he works out with at the gym that's a cop. So he calls him up. He says, listen, the guy's at my house. He not have any weapon. We're going to drive down Conway Road in 45 minutes, pull us over. You can arrest him. He's not going to have any weapon. Okay, so don't hurt him. So he didn't know I had a knife in my pocket. So 45 minutes later, we're driving down the road, and I get out of the car, and I pull out the knife, and I say, shoot me type of thing. You know, I want to commit suicide. Well, the cops had pulled you over, and you— There were a lot of cops. They were like undercover cars and all kinds of stuff. And he actually, and you know, I started running, and Bob actually tackled me and got between me and the cops so they wouldn't shoot me. So you, you, you jump out of the car, face the cops with a knife, and say, shoot me. Yep, and start running. And, and can then, I take a half a step back here? Sure. So you're watching a TV? No, news, the news. We watch the weather to see what the weather's oh, like. Oh, so you're watching the news on yeah. TV, and you see your picture come up saying this guy's armed and dangerous. Yeah. And then you got in the car with this gentleman. 45 minutes later. Right. Well, a little more than 45 minutes later. But, but you did, did you, was there a thought into your head, well, what is he going to do? He just saw the same thing you saw. You know, Bob even said, you know, I've got money in the bank. If you want to go to the airport and fly away, I says, no, I'm not, I'm not running from anything. You know, I'm not doing anything like that. You know, so he, he made a decision to, for my best interest to do yeah, something. It was for your best interest. Yeah, sure. Saved my life. Yeah. Okay. He basically, he, did. he, he brokered the saving of your, your life. life. Yeah. yeah. So you're arrested. They take you to jail. You're in jail for 18 months, and you, at this point, you're suicidal. You want to kill yourself. But the first, your wife and daughters come to visit. Yeah. What happened? Well, you know, I've, I've, it comes a point where I'm just tired of hurting everybody I love. You know, and 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 I can't fix my problem. I'm, I'm an addict, and I can't get off the dope. Right. And it comes to a point where I don't know what else to do but eliminate me. I'm the issue. I'm the problem. And in my addiction, I blamed everybody else. But when I'm sitting in the county jail all alone, based on an electric chair, um, 
and I'm clean. Things started become more transparent. But the first weekend, my my wife came up, and she was my wife at the time with my three daughters. And I'm walking down this highway with these little cubby holes. And as soon as I turn to the side, I see my wife with my six-year-old daughter in her lap and the two- and the four-year-old in the window. And lips and fingers hit the window. Daddy, when you coming home? Daddy, where you at? Daddy, when you coming home? And it realized me that if I hurt myself, I'm going to hurt my family. And I can't do that anymore. Right. So my resolution is suicide is a way to hurt your family for the rest of their lives. Yeah, right. Okay, and I can't do that to my family. So I made a resolution that, you know, that's not the solution. Okay, I'm at a point in my life where I'm in prison facing an electric chair. So what else is there to do but sit and wait, you know? And then, and then some of the guys in the, in the quad were Christians, and I started praying, and I started right. accepting Christ, and I started asking for forgiveness. But I couldn't forgive myself. How long did that transformation take? It took three years for me to get off to get the dope out of my system. I would wake up in the middle of the night blowing out smoke and I'd be high, just as high as if I'd have took a real hit off really? the dope. I mean, the stuff had me so, my body was so accustomed to it. I would wake up in the middle of the night blowing out smoke with a rush, just like I'd smoked dope. Oof. It was, and it, it took about three years to get out of my system to where I no longer had dreams about it, about using and stuff, or had nightmares about my family you know, right. and the pain I put them through. Um, July of 1991, you're you're convicted of first degree murder. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're sent to Polk uh, Correctional Institution, yes. and about that time, your wife go, goes ahead and she initiates a divorce. Was how difficult was that for you? Well, I was. It was very difficult for me. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, I have all these physical possessions and everything, but I got my family. You know, you can, I can, like I told her, I can buy toys again. I can get new toys, tools. I can get new toys. I get a new house. I can get new antiques. I can't get you and the kids again. So I said, but you need to go ahead and and go on with your life. Because if I was out there and you were in here, I would do it. So you need to find a good environment for the kids. I'm not going to be there anymore. And she says, well, I'm going to stick by you. She she says, I may not be married to you, but I'm going to stick by you. And she did for 30 years plus. And you still have a relationship with her now, correct? She's my best friend. Right. Wow. And her husband. Right. So. So, interesting. You're, you go to Polk Correctional Institution, and your first cousin, Carl Shuck, yep. is also there on a first-degree murder charge. Yes. Talk about that. Well, Eddie, a couple years before that, he had um, got into a robbery with another guy that right. was older than him, and uh, the other guy killed the the, the, the shopkeeper, store clerk, the right. store clerk, and um, he got a life sentence. So when I get to Polk CI, uh, my cousin Eddie's there, and uh, he takes me under his wing and kind of shows me, you know, these are. And my brother told me too. He says, "Don't borrow money, don't lend money, don't gamble, don't mess with dope or, or alcohol, and don't mess with homosexuals." He says, "If you don't do those five things, you'll do good time in prison." So I was listening to my brother, and then Chuck got there and he plugged me into. A lot of positive things because, you know, I didn't get my high school diploma because I broke my leg. So the first thing I did was I got my GED. I qualified for Pell Grants. I took a business administration class. And my ambition is to send everything to my daughters to let them know that daddy's not a piece of crap anymore, that daddy's not a drug addict anymore, that daddy's getting better anymore, that daddy values education. You know, try to father from prison which is probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Right. How did you do that? Just by communicating with them and 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 showing them that you're changed? My mom was alive till 2004, and she, her and Rose made sure that I got regular visits. Polk was close to Orlando. Lake CI was close to Orlando. Tomoka Correctional Institution was close to Orlando. And when I was close to Orlando, I got visits pretty much every month. But then I got moved to other camps. I've been to 16 prisons. I've been up to Santa Rosa, to Appalachia, to Everglades, to Charlotte. You know, whenever it's over an hour and a half or two and a half hours away, the visits were infrequent. Yeah. They were like every six mm-hmm. months or so. But I always was able to call and talk to my daughters on Friday night. It was like a ritual. 
William, here, here's a question, and I, I sort of asked this question before. You know, again, now you know you meet your cousin. It was your your brother, four armed robberies, life sentences. Your father shot somebody. Fortunately, didn't kill your uncle. He's six months in an insane asylum. Now you're in prison with your cousin, who's in for a first degree murder charge. I know Carl. He was in our in the Corrections Transition Program. Was there a common denominator between the four of you guys? Here's you know one family. What, what did you ever think what the correlation or common denominator was? Well, not with Shuck because he didn't do any drugs or anything. Right. Okay. But between me and my brother and my father, alcohol and drugs were the catalysts to everything. Um, and everybody on my father's side of the family, all the men seemed to have parted ways through alcohol. Um, all my dad's brothers. So for the, my, my father's side of the family, it seems like there was a lot of alcoholism involved in that until my brother and I, and then drugs hit the scene. Alcohol became kind of, became kind of an um, outdated thing in the 60s and the 70s. The so. passe. Yeah, drugs came through. Right. Not that alcohol isn't just as dangerous as drugs, but alcohol is legal. Right. Drugs isn't. And, you know, we always ask people, how did you survive 30, 40 years in prison? Now, I know you, you've sort of given us an answer that because your brother told you to stay away from borrowing money, lending money, homosexual activity, drugs and gambling. Because that's usually just as as Barry Stevens told us last week, the, the root of 95 percent of all problems in right. prison. However, a real asset, you became an asset in the prison system because you became you worked at the law library. I, when I got my high school diploma, my GED, I became a tutor, and then I took the college course through a Pell Grant, and then I went into the law library, and I worked in the law library for many years, and in 99, I wrote a book, actually, on how to beat the system as far as disciplinary reports and the seven different levels of post-conviction proceedings, and it kind of made me a bad guy with the Department of Corrections because I've got this booklet on the DR checklist on how to beat DRs, which are disciplinary reports. Is that why you were <laughs> transferred? Is that why you were transferred among 16 prisons throughout your 30 years? That's, other than routine transfers, that's the catalyst for what happened to me. Every couple of years, the Department of Corrections would put out a memo and tell all of the librarians where I'm at and that they're not allowed to put this book in confinement for guys that are facing disciplinary reports. So, so was this book like uh, contraband? In the, in the... No, because it was actually published by my mom to raise money for my kids' college funds, and they wrote me three disciplinary reports for the book saying that I was starting a business, even though every penny off that book went to my kids' college funds, and my mom even paid for the book to be published and mailed out of her own pocket. What, 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 did the book do well? It did extremely well, and I'm slowly revising it now to do a, a ninth edition because every couple of years you have to update it. Oh, I love so this. I'm doing a, and I this is a post-conviction right. book. Now I'm, I've also written a pre-trial book everything you need to know before you go to trial but i haven't published it yet so life take over i got out and i gotta have to go to work so i'm, I'm involved in working and getting back on my feet you said in 30 years you only got in six physical fights in prison but you only but you only, and you felt in danger one time with a guy at tomoka what was that issue about the guy at tomoka had already killed two of his roommates Ugh. On separate occasions, he's got pictures of him going in the room with a lock and beating her brains out, and there's blood all over the walls. And he's had two trials and already been sentenced to two consecutive lives. And he's across from the hall from me, and he's talking about, you know, he's, I can tell he's on the fringe of doing it again. And thankfully, I was involved in programs, and two weeks later, they moved me out of the dorm. I think it was a week and a half later. And two weeks later, he beat another guy almost to death. I mean, it's a miracle the guy, and this guy has this, and and I truly across the hall, <laughs> so wow, this guy can walk over here with a lock and beat me to death, you know. So you never know. Um, this guy bragged about it, but not everybody brags about it. Well, and and I, you, you you had some good news in 2015. You had your first parole hearing. You're now right. You, right. You're sentenced to life, which means 25 years mandatory. <laughs> And now you're eligible for parole consideration. Right. So your first parole hearing comes up, and the gentleman sets you off till 2036, which is still a long time away. And yeah. you said, come on, I'm, I'm going to die in prison. And for some reason, he lowers it down to 2022. What happened? First, let me say that I, 
when I got into prison, the way I stayed out of trouble and stayed in a good environment was I always got into programs. So I did Tier 1 and Tier 2, which are six-month outpatient drug substance abuse programs. Then I did Tier 3 and Tier 4, which are one-year residential programs. Then I did 10 years in Horizon. I did Life Path. I did every program I could. So when I get in front of this guy, he's got a stack of certificates this high. And I told him, I said, those weren't for you. That's just God using this for a purpose. Those are for my kids. Every certificate was sent to my kid. And when he told me 2036, I said, you mean I'm going to die in prison all alone? He said, not necessarily. We talked for about 10 minutes, and after about 10 minutes, he says, I can't do this. And he took a pen, and all the aggravators, they aggravate you for a firearm and different, different elements. He started striking through the tens and started writing fives. He said, I'm going to help you get out of prison. I'm going to send you to FIU. Right. So then he, he rec- not only does he lower your projected to release to 2022, he, he recommends you into the corrections transition program at Everglades with program. Dr. Sharon. Yes. But you couldn't get transferred right away because of something called a, a special review. Right. So that prevented you from being transferred. Right. And when I got in front of the parole commission in January of 2015, they set it off five years. He recommended Yeah, but wait a minute. What was the special review that kept you out of Everglades? It was that a gentleman at Lake CI wanted the room change with his homosexual friend. So he went to the captain's office and told a bunch of lies about me about the book I published. And I get locked up and shipped. And they put a special review that he and I are not allowed to be on the same compound. Right. So he's at Everglades where the FIU program is with the Corrections Transition Program, and I can't go there because he's there. So Rose actually wrote him, and we got affidavits from me and him trying to get the special review off, and we couldn't get it off. So he eventually gets transferred to Dade CI, and I'm at Charlotte and Life Path. Pro- I mean, no, I'm in South Bay, matter of fact. And I finished the programs there, and I asked the DOC. Now he's not there anymore in the parole commission, right. and they transfer me to Everglades. To Everglades, in into the Corrections Transition Program in 2016. Yes, November First 24th. impression of the of Dr. Sharon in the program? The, um, the environment is different in that the people in the program are going home. They're not preparing like a transitional program to get ready to go home. They're actually preparing to succeed when they do go home. And there's a difference. The difference is when you get out, there's a lot of elements that we're not all familiar with. 30 years in prison, I've never used a cell phone. Right. I mean, a lot of guys in prison have cell phones, but I've never used one. I've never taken the risk. <clears throat> um, there, I've never used social media. I've never used digital money. There's a lot of things I'm not, you know, that I don't know. And this program has the FIU students coming in and teaching us about these things. So the mentality right. of the men in the program is different, and my mentality, too, is different because now I'm a man going home. There's what, light at the end of the tunnel. Right. Your second parole hearing came up on August, you know, it looks like in 2020, and it was approved, and you were released on August 7th of 2000. August 14th. August 14th, 2020. Um, and where are you living now? I'm living in Jacksonville with my oldest daughter. And I'm going to move in June, probably with my youngest daughter. I want to spend a season with each one of my daughters to get to know them and their grandkids. Any grandkids? I was going to ask ten. you. I got 10 grandkids. 10 grandkids. Ten grandkids. Ten grandkids. You know, wow. I, we, we've got time. We've got a few minutes. I want to ask you two questions because you, you got very emotional when you talked about that you no longer wanted to create a victim and you felt you had victimized your family. Talk about that. I, I victimized everybody. But the people I love the most are the people I seem to hurt the most. So my commitment is to no longer create victims, okay? And whether it be my family, the person next door, what have you. The key to that is I'm going to fail. In some element in my life, sometime I'm going to fail. But as much as it depends on me, I'm not going to let that happen again. And the key for me is staying clean. Yeah. May 10th, I'll have 31 years without any substances. Amen. And I'm proud of that. Yeah. I'm proud of that. I'm going to keep that sobriety date. And I also email over 50 people in prison to let them know that there's life after prison. You just have to follow Dr. Shearn's formula. You have to do the next right thing. The next right thing isn't picking up a cell phone. It's not getting high. It's not beating up somebody. It's doing what you know needs to be done to get out of prison. What That's was what the best advice you got at the Corrections Transition Program that you'll never forget? 
Well, there's so much. There's so much. Um, I kept asking for programs, and Dr. Shern says, listen, when you're here, you're not supposed to need any more help. Okay, so if you keep asking the parole commission for more programs, you're telling them you need more help. There's right, a point, you're supposed to be a, transitioning out. There's not a point more where programs. you don't need any more programs because I was ready to go to another drug program. Right. I was ready to get released to a program, a drug program. You know, and I'm telling her, I've got all these years clean. She goes, at this stage, you're not supposed to need any more programs. You're supposed to be ready. How valuable was the Voices of Time Gavel Club in preparing people with their communication skills? Yeah, fortunately, I'd already been involved in Toastmasters, so I'd maxed out all my awards. But when I got there, is I see so many people that have the um, hesitancy to, and the fear of speaking in public. Right. And uh, the Toastmasters program just opened it up. I mean, these guys come out of their shell. Next thing you know, they're they're doing service work. They're right. doing leadership work. They're setting examples. Uh, they're being exemplary in all the things they do because they have the courage in themselves to step up and to be able to communicate. If what? you can't communicate right. and ask questions and dialogue, then you can't do anything. Yeah, what 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 you're you're still a relatively young guy. You're in great shape. What what do you want to do? What do you want to do with the rest of your life? <clears throat> I'm 62 and I've got my own business. I and community control was really hard because I have to do weekly reports where I'm going to be every hour for the following week. And I do renovations now. So I go into homes and I renovate the homes. And I can't go bid a job, get approved for the bid, and then go get the materials and go get my tools and then come back because that's three different changes in one location. So I had to wait until I was done with my community control. And I went to work for Nichols Truck Body and rebuilt truck right. body welding. Then I got my business license. And I bought a truck, and I started doing renovations. So you're a businessman, a business yeah, owner. Absolutely. Yeah. He's an entrepreneur. So That's great. My, you know, what, my what, mission is, by the time I'm 70, is to get enough rental properties to be able to semi-retire. Sure. And uh, be able to maintenance the rental properties. It's not as much labor as renovating homes is right, right now. William, you were an outstanding guest. I hope you can come back. We, we, we talk on the phone periodically. <laughs> I've just sent you some Toastmaster material that you ordered. You should have it by the time you get back to Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. But you're always a, an outstanding guest, and I, and I hope you can come back. Thank you. Thank you. Andy, final comments on today's show? Wow. It, it really, he blew me away, this, this gentleman, William Steele here. I mean... Um, how drugs just overtook his life. And William, I got to just say this one thing to you is you hurt people that you love the most because they're the people that love you the most. Yeah. And that's what made it all hurt. But you seems like you're on the right track. 31 years of sobriety. Keep it up, my friend. I think you're going to do great and as a member of a productive member of our society. Thank you. Well said. Well said. Well, that does it for today. And thank you all so much for tuning in for another episode of Men Going Home. And a very special thank you to Tom Corcoran in Delray Beach, Marty Buten in New York, Martha Laura Zayas in Miami, and John and Nono Hedstrom in Portugal. Thank you all so much for watching and writing to us here. And thank you all so much for watching. See you all next week here on Men Going Home.